Right, I think we can get going and other people can join as um, as we go along. So, yeah, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, live lecture series in a masterclass in screen dialogue. Uh, we're joined by Dr. David Cottis, who is the program leader for um, BA Film at Middlesex University and is a senior lecturer in script writing. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to David. If you've, oh, before we start, if you've got any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A uh, and I'll monitor that as uh, we go along. Okay, thanks very much for that introduction, Chris. Um, yeah, as, as you said, my name is David Cottis and I'm Senior Lecturer in Script Writing here at Middlesex. Um, and what I'm going to do in the course of this lecture is I'm going to talk a little bit about the techniques of writing dialogue um, for, uh, for screen. OK, um, I should perhaps explain, I've, I've got a slightly weird background as a film lecturer in that um, I haven't I didn't historically work in film. My background's actually in the theatre, um, which is one of the one of the arts that contributes to film, I suppose you'd say. Um, so I've worked as a playwright and a director, primarily on fringe theatre, and I've always been really interested in the relationship between cinema and theatre. Uh, because in some ways they're very, very similar, and in some ways they're very, very different. Okay. Um, um, but one of the respects in which they're similar is that since films started to talk around 1927, dialogue has been a really important part of them. I mean, it's a visual medium, obviously. The visual is always, almost always, going to be more important than the verbal. But then equally, um, there are so many great filmmakers and great films which are defined by their writing, by their dialogue. Somebody like Quentin Tarantino, obviously, is a great writer of dialogue. Somebody like Eric Roma, okay, the French director. So although we say it's a visual medium, it's a medium in which dialogue is also really important. Um, and I've been a script reader, both for theatre and for film, for a lot of my time. And the big thing that, is, that I found, the big flaw that I found in pretty much 90% of the scripts for either theatre or for film that I've read in the course of the time I've been doing this. There's generally two things. One of two things is wrong with most of them. Okay, apart from the good ones. Number one, there's a problem of structure. So a lot of scripts have basic problems of, of structure, of storytelling, just of giving the audience the experience um, that they want at the time when they want it. Okay, so that's a big thing. And that's very common to both theatre and to film, problems of structure. But the other big thing that I've noticed as a flaw in, as I say, pretty much 90% of the scripts that I've read for both medium is what's called on the nose dialogue. Um, now, I, this is going to be a fairly interactive lecture. I'm going to be asking you your opinions on things quite a lot. Um, so can, um, have people heard this phrase, on the nose dialogue? Can you put in the Q&A if you've encountered the phrase before? So I'm just seeing if anything's coming up now. Nope. OK, good. That's one no. Has anybody heard it? OK, um, so that being the case, I will. OK, um, so I'm just getting something similar like um, uh, tell, don't show. Yeah, because you always say show, don't tell in terms of writing. And on the nose dialogue is when you tell don't uh, rather than showing. So, all right, let me give you an example. Um, imagine you've got a character in a film who is the inheritor of a, a gangland family okay he's the child of a gangland family and then at some point towards the end of the film he might say something like he might have a big speech where he said something like you know i used to think that my family were wrong um, in spending lives of crime and in murdering people and in pursuing violence but i've come to understand that they were absolutely in the right and I've decided that it's time for me to move on and take my place in the family as a gangster. OK. All right. What film does not include that piece of dialogue? What film is that not a quotation from? 
again, you can put it in the Q&A if you like. Little pause while I'm waiting. Okay, I, sh I shall jump in here. It's a, it's a line of dialogue that could have been, but was not in the film, The Godfather. Okay, um, towards the end of the film, Al Pacino has a situation where he could have had a bit of dialogue like that. Obviously he doesn't have it because it would be terrible. Um, what he does do is he lights a cigarette and notice that his hand isn't shaking. And that conveys all the emotion of the uh, of the speech that I just gave, okay, but without a necessity for any dialogue, okay. So that's what avoiding on the nose dialogue is like. On the nose dialogue is when a character says exactly what he or she is thinking and feeling, okay, and it's a cardinal sin in all script writing for any medium, um, and. I'll, I'll talk about why later, actually. But the simple reason is that it doesn't give the actors anything to do, OK? It means that there is no gap between what we perceive and what the characters say. And what's interesting about dialogue is in the gap between those two things, OK? Um, I said before that this is going to be quite an interactive lecture. So you're going to need... Um, I'm going to be asking you to write some stuff in the course of this lecture. So you're gonna need something to write on and something to write with, okay? Um, so that can be a pad and paper or um, a laptop or in your phone, if you like, I, I don't particularly care. So long as you've got something to write on and something to write with. Is everybody, has everybody got that? Tell me, if, tell me in the chat if you need some time to get something. David, sorry, it's Chris yeah. here. Just to let you know, I can actually, give them uh, everyone access to talk as well. Um, so I don't know if that's, oh, that's easy. Okay. Um, so we can uh, do- Yeah, if you could do that, actually, that would make yeah. my life simpler than having to communicate by the Q, by the Q and A all the time. Thanks very okay. much. I'll do that now. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so you, all right, so you don't have to write it. That saves me a bit of thinking. Um, it has, does anybody need a bit more time to get something to write on and something to write with? Okay, cool. I'll take that as a no. You can unmute yourself and say if, uh, if you do need some more time. So what I'd like you to do is I would like you to take a couple of minutes um, and just think of examples of films or television series or plays or graphic novels or novels or anything really, any form of writing that you think has particularly good dialogue, okay? Um, just take a couple of minutes now, I'll mute myself um, and I'll tell you when to stop and just write a list of anything that you think of as having particularly good dialogue, okay? And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. All right, go ahead. In the meantime, I'll just share my screen actually because I've got a basic PowerPoint here.
Okay, and hold it there. And okay, can I hear some examples of something that you consider to have really good dialogue? You can either type it in the Q&A or you can just unmute yourself and holler it out. Either is fine. Okay, so let's just get some examples of what we think of as particularly good dialogue. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, Anita, um, Raging Bull, that's an interesting example. Okay, yep, um, great film, absolutely agree. Why particularly do you think of it, of that as having particularly good dialogue? Um, as I say, you can either unmute yourself or you can put in the Q&A, whichever you prefer. Okay, um, while we're waiting, um, Louise, you said the marvellous Mrs. Meisel. Again, great television series, I quite agree. Louise, why, why do you particularly think of that as having especially good dialogue? Okay, so all right, so it's really smart and witty, not basic. Okay, that's really interesting. What do you mean by basic? Okay, while Louise is typing, I'll look at Harmony. Um, in Brooklyn 99, the dialogue is very comedic, absolutely, um, which aligns with the fact that it's a comedy. There are many pauses and awkward moments for the audience to laugh. That's very interesting. So it's not just about dialogue, it's about the moments when, it's, it's not just what is said, it's the moment when nobody is saying anything. So silence um, is also a form of dialogue. Um, Louise, when she says not basic, they say things in not um, an obvious way. OK, that's really interesting. Anita, um, the scene where he gets put in jail and screams, I'm not an animal, is really haunting to me. The dialogue shows the desperation. OK, yeah, that's interesting. So it shows um, if, if I've got if I've got this right, what you're saying here is it really shows the character it really demonstrates, um, it really shows who the character is and what he's all about. And the conversational dialogue is also quick and snappy. Yeah, yeah. It's a characteristic of Martin Scorsese films, actually, isn't it? Is that everybody in Scorsese film talks in this very New York way. Everybody has this quite snappy way of talking, which gives you a strong sense of the place and of the world that these characters come from. And again, it tells you things about the characters. Yeah, that's very true. Um, Louise, again, talking about the marvellous Mrs. Mizell. I'm surprised by the dialogue a lot, which engages me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a good basic thing, I would say, a good uh, quality of all good dialogue and actually all, all good filmmaking, really, is you want to be surprised. You don't want a situation where... Um, where the audience is ahead of you, you know, as an audience member, you do not want to be in a position where you know what is going to happen or where you know what uh, the character is going to say. So, yeah, absolutely. Being able to surprise your audience is really important. Um, Anita's still talking about um, Raging Bull. He can't comprehend why he's in jail. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. Yeah, again, so the, it's a very much an important thing about character. OK, good. So we're getting um, we're getting a sort of small list of characteristics that we associate with particularly good dialogue. So it's, it's, um, it's it can be funny. Um, it's not basic. I think that's really important. It's not obvious. OK, um, it can be funny. Um, if it's surprising. I think that's very important. Um, so, like I said before, your audience doesn't get ahead of you. 
and it says things about the character. It ties in with the character and the emotions. Okay, good, good. Um, so we've got the sort of small list of things that we associate with good with good dialogue. Okay, uh, now what I'm going to do is I would like you to take a couple of minutes and can you think of any films or television series or again, any other medium that you think has particularly bad dialogue? Okay, and again, just take a couple of minutes and write them down now and I'll mute myself. Okay, and hold it there. And same routine, you can either say it out loud or you can put it in the Q&A if you prefer. Um, any, any films or series or anything that you think has particularly bad dialogue? The name of George Lucas often comes up at this point. Riverdale, okay, my, um, why particularly? Why do you um, think of that as particularly bad dialogue? I haven't seen it, so I don't have an opinion. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, now that's interesting. Batman versus Superman. Yeah, yeah. Well, the name of Zack Snyder is often mentioned as well when I have this. My main gripe is Lex Luthor. They made him have this really quick, rambly, crazy Joker speech, and it just doesn't fit him. Ah, okay. So that's really important. So one of the characteristics of good dialogue is it has to be appropriate for the person who says it. Um, again, it has to relate to the character. And if I got this right, Anita, the point you're making is you have one character, sorry, um, talking in a way that you particularly associate with another character. So you called it this crazy joker speech. So it's, it's a way in which you expect a different character to speak rather than the way in which you would expect Lex Luthor to speak. Of course, Batman versus Superman also has that terrible bit of dialogue where they both realise their mothers have the same name and that uh, has this immense... Um, immense, uh, how, how would you describe this, immense emotional effect. Okay, Maya, it's quite jarring as if you're watching a poorly done play, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Um, can, can you unpack that a little bit? Can you say what, what it is that makes it jarring? Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anita talking here about Lex Luthor. He's usually very formal, confident and knowledgeable. And you're quoting the Martha line. Yeah, exactly. So Lex Luthor should not speak in the same way that the Joker does, because they're such different. Uh, Maya, like, it's all very bizarre and they don't believe or feel what they're saying. Okay, so that's really important. So believability. 
Um, you, you have to believe that the characters actually mean what they say. And harmony is interesting here. Um, when dialogue is predictable, it's very annoying. Absolutely. <laughs> when a character tells a joke which doesn't land properly, like you can tell they're trying too hard to be funny, it ends up feeling too scripted and not authentic. Again, that's a good word, isn't it? Authentic. Is it seems to be a quality of what we consider to be good dialogue. And yeah, um, writers will tell you and actors will tell you actually that comedy is incredibly difficult to get right, partly because when it goes wrong, you really know. When it doesn't land, as you say, um, it, it is an incredibly unpleasant experience. Okay, all right, so. Um, this is, uh, this is like the big basic blurb of what I've just been talking about. Um, but we've got a list of qualities, I think, that we associate with particularly good dialogue. Um, it needs to be surprising. It needs to be appropriate for the character. Um, it helps if it's funny and witty and snappy. Um, and it helps if it's emotional, um, if it conveys the character's emotional. And it helps if it's believable. So not like you were saying about Riverdale. OK, so this, this is interesting. We're all get, we're getting a sense, I think, of the things that make good dialogue. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about three things which I think are common to all good dialogue um, in whatever medium. And then we are going to do a little exercise. OK, so. OK. This is what I think of as the three essentials of dialogue and character. OK, and neatly enough, they all begin with an S, which makes them nice and easy to remember. And I call them separation, stakes and subtext. OK, um, I'll, so I'll break that down one by one. Um, what I mean by separation, very simple, really. It means that there needs to be a difference between the characters. OK, um, good dialogue is very rarely between people who agree on everything. OK, uh, because then it comes across as inauthentic. If everybody in your film talks like you, you've got a problem. OK, so you need to find ways of separating the characters. People sometimes say that all good drama comes out of conflict. I'm not absolutely sure that's true, but I think there is some truth in it, is that you need a character who wants something and you need a character who wants something different, because if they want exactly the same things, they don't have anything to talk about. They just help each other and go away and that's the end of the scene. Um, and I think conflict isn't quite the right word. But you do need separation. You do need the characters to be su sufficiently different for the um, for the dynamic between them to be interesting. And this, by the way, is why radio is a really good thing for writers. It's a really good training ground for writing dialogue, because if you're writing for radio, by definition, you don't have the visual to help you. So you have to create characters who are sufficiently different in the way that they speak for the audience to know who's talking at any particular time. So I'm not just talking about accent or, you know, having one male character and one female character or whatever. I'm talking about the fact they need to have different ways of speaking because otherwise the audience won't find it interesting and they'll get lost. They won't be able to follow the plot. OK, so number one, separation. OK, number two, stakes. What's at stake? This is a thing that you will have find script editors say a great deal when they look at scripts. They'll say, OK, what's at stake? What's in this scene? So I said before that dramatic characters tend to be people who want something. OK, the question is, what do they want and what will happen if they don't get it? OK, so in practice, you very rarely, oops, sorry, went to the wrong screen there. Um, in practice, you very rarely have a dramatic scene which is about somebody who doesn't want anything because it's not interesting. It's as simple as that, really. We need to be concerned about what the character is trying to get and what will happen if they don't get it. Now, don't get me wrong. This doesn't necessarily mean that um, every story has to be about somebody who is trying to save the world. 
okay, you, you know, there's a place for them and there's nothing wrong with them. Um, but there has to be something in it, in the story, that is sufficiently interesting for us to uh, be engaged in it. And that can sometimes be something quite unusual. So for instance, there's a really good British film of the 80s called My Beautiful Laundrette. Um, and it's about a guy who wants to open a laundrette. Now, in and of itself, that doesn't sound especially interesting, okay? Um, but in the context of the film, it's terribly important to the character that he opens this laundrette. Um, it's his way of relating to his family, of proving himself, of, um, of establishing his relationship with another character. So the laundrette becomes a symbol of all these um, really major things in the character's life. So although, you know, we wouldn't normally be that interested in whether or not somebody successfully opens a laundrette, in the context of this film, um, seek it out if you haven't seen it, by the way, it's a great film. Um, Daniel Day-Lewis gives uh, a very young Daniel Day-Lewis uh, is in it. Um, he, in this film, we really care about whether this guy opens a laundrette. Okay, and the third thing is subtext. And I've sort of already spoken about that when I was speaking of um, about on the nose dialogue, because on the nose dialogue is when characters speak without subtext. OK, it's when they say, like I said before, exactly what they are thinking. And A, that's not very interesting. And B, it's not realistic. In real life, we don't normally say everything that we're thinking. And um, this is the screen that I went to before. This is a line about subtext, which is quoted by the story guru, Robert McKee, in his book, um, Story. If anybody is interested in writing, this is a book you should definitely seek out. And he says, there's a screenwriter's dictum quoted by Robert McKee, which is, if the scene is about what the scene is about, then you're in deep shit. Okay, so it's much more interesting, for instance, to write a love story um, a love scene between two people who are talking about what they're going to have for dinner. OK, if you want to write a love scene, you don't want to write about two characters talking about whether they're in love. It's much more interesting if they write it, if they talk about, for instance, what they're going to have for dinner and then uh, what comes out. OK, uh, is the fact that they're falling in love, just to take a really obvious example. So. These, I think, are three qualities which all good writing of dialogue has. OK, um, they need to be you need to have characters who have uh, who are sufficiently different for the dynamic between them to be interesting. Um, there needs to be something at stake, something that we care about. And there needs to be some kind of subtext. It needs to be not all on the surface, not basic, to use that word um, that was uh, that was used earlier. OK, so are there any thoughts before I move on? OK. All right. So what we are going to do now is we are going to do an exercise, which is from this book, Playwriting, A Practical Guide by Noel Gregg. Now, as its title suggests, this is primarily a book for playwrights. Um, but it's full of really, really good exercises that are useful across all dramatic media. Um, and I use this book quite a lot in my own teaching of, um, of screenwriting. Um, and it goes back to the fact that if writers write on the nose dialogue, and like I said before, they often do, it's usually for one reason, which is that they don't know their characters well enough, okay? And what I mean by that is if you create a dramatic character and if you write dialogue for him or her, you need to know what that character would say in that situation. OK, um, and that means you need to know a bit about the character. If you don't know your character very well and your character is very happy. It's very difficult to think of anything for them to say, except. I'm very happy, which is a really, really boring line. OK. In real life, of course, all of us 
react to being really happy in completely different ways. Okay, we, we say completely different things, um, depending on our background, our lives, our class, where we're from, all sorts of things like that. We all express ourselves in that situation in a completely different way. So that ought to be true of fictional characters as much as is true of real people. Okay, um, so the way to avoid this, I think, is to make sure that you know your characters really well. And a way of doing this um, is to write character biography. Louise, you raised your hand. I'd either turn your mic off or put it in the Q&A, whichever you like. If at any point you do have a question, by the way, just raise your hand, that's great. Oh, sorry, accident. Okay, right. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an exercise from this book and it's called Conjuring Up a Character. And what you're gonna do in the next few minutes is you are gonna create a fictional character. You're gonna create a character who had no existence before uh, you came to this lecture. Um, you'll need something to write on and something to write with. So if you, if you haven't got that, you need to get that now. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you a series of questions about this fictional character that you're just about to create, okay? And um, you're gonna write down the answers. Now, there's a couple of sort of rules. That's not quite the right word, but I can't think of a better one. There's sort of, some sort of rules for this. Number one, don't overthink it, okay? Don't worry about it too much. This is one of those exercises where you really need to let the subconscious mind do its thing, okay? Don't base the character on anybody you know, um, including yourself. Um, you're not trying to recreate somebody who already exists here. You are trying to create a new fictional character. Try and create somebody who's a bit different from yourself. So don't create somebody who's, you know, the same age, sex, ethnicity as you. Try and create somebody who's a little bit out from left field. Um, allow, allow yourself to be surprised and allow yourself to create things that might at first be contradictory or seem to be contradictory. Because interesting characters are like this. Interesting characters, generally speaking, have contradictions of some sort, okay? Um, so don't try to push them towards a certain kind of character. Um, allow yourself to come up with things that might not necessarily fit or, or appear to fit anyway. Um, and always remember, you know nothing about this person. Okay, all right, any questions before we start? Okay, so I'm gonna read out a list of questions and you are gonna write down the answers. Okay, here goes. So the first one, nice, easy one to start with, their gender. There's a fairly small number of possibilities for that. The first one, their gender. Next one, their age. Their ethnicity or race, if you prefer. Three physical characteristics. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, I skipped one. So now you've got you've got their gender, their race, and their uh, sorry, their gender, their age, and their ethnicity or race. Once you've got these three pieces of information, you can give them a name. Okay, next one. This is the one I skipped to by mistake. Three physical characteristics. So the way they look, any kind of mannerism, um, their tone of voice, anything like that.
Next question. Where does their money come from? So do they have a job? If so, what is it? If not, how do they live? What sort of accommodation do they live in? So house, flat, homeless, live on a boat, whatever. And where exactly in the world is that accommodation? And try and be precise here. So if it's in London, for instance, don't say just London. It's a big city, you know. Give me an area. Give me a specific area that they live. So. Just checking. So those are the questions we've asked so far. Gender, age, ethnicity, name, three physical characteristics, where their money comes from, accommodation, and location. Okay, so that's what you might broadly call the facts about your character. We're going to get on to slightly more nebulous stuff now. Okay, so next question. Write down something that they lack in life. Like I said, don't overthink it. Next question, something they need right now. A secret they have. A problem they have. A memory they have. Something they believe. Something they wish for. So that's the next group. So like I said, they're slightly more nebulous and less factual than the other lot. Okay, and there's one, just one more, one more set of questions. Um, don't worry, we're in the home stretch. Where they are at this very moment.
what they're doing at this very moment. what they are thinking or saying at this very moment. And finally, three other things you know about them as a result of having written this list. Okay, um, does it, does, has anybody missed any of the categories? I'll just go over them again. Say in the chat if you missed any. Okay, so has everybody filled in? All of these, has everybody answered it? Any, all of the questions? Does anybody need a bit longer? Say in the Q and A if you need any longer. Okay, good. All right, so you've now all created a new fictional character who had no existence um, until you started this exercise. Okay, does anybody want to turn there uh, to unmute themselves? and share the character they've created. No, no pressure. You can if you like. You're done, Mike. Excellent, good, glad to hear it. Okay. Does anybody want to share their character? Okay, what I'll do in that case um, is I'll, I'll tell you, this is the character that Noel Gregg created as a result of doing this exercise himself. Okay. Male, 78. British Asian, and his name's Taresh. He walks with a limp, smokes a pipe, and is bald. He works in a tobacconist's shop. He lives in a small rented attic room in a side street in Sheffield. He lacks friendship. Right now, he needs some more tobacco for his pipe. He secretly steals pipe tobacco when the shop owner is out. He has a problem with his back. He remembers the time when he lived by a beach. He believes that his landlord is a murderer. He wishes he could live by the beach again. At this very moment, he is in the shop alone. He's opening the jar with pipe tobacco in it. He's saying to himself, the woman is the miser anyway. If she paid me well, I wouldn't have to be a thief. He reads comic books. He keeps his money under the mattress and he goes to the opera once a year. Okay, so that's the character that Tarish created, uh, sorry, that Noel Gregg created, Tarish is the character, um, as a result of doing this exercise. Um, were any of you surprised by the characters you created? Or do you have any other thoughts, actually? Again, say in the chat. Yeah, it was fun. I was surprised. Okay, <laughs> Maya, that's interesting. You were surprised how easily it came to you. Why, why were you surprised? You weren't expecting it to be that easy. Yeah, it's sometimes it's sometimes is easier if you just think about it less. And in fact, that's a that's a good general rule in writing is part of it is just about um, 
allowing you allowing things to happen you know turning off the self-censor which most people have let's face it um and just allowing yourself to write okay um so that's what's called a character profile or a character biography and what you would do as a screenwriter or playwright or novelist indeed is you would write something like that for most of the major characters in fact probably pretty much all of the major characters in your screenplay um the the british playwright and um screenwriter noel coward who wrote a uh, brief encounter had a very nice line on this he said um you must always know what your character has for breakfast even though you should never show them um, having breakfast. Um, oh, that's interesting, Mark. You can see your character in his life so vividly. Exactly, exactly. And that's kind of the point of the exercise, is that you would, you, you've, um, you haven't just created a superficial character. You've created a character that you now know in some detail. And so the next thing you would do is you would then create a character profile for another character, who had a different philosophy and different wants and put them together and that's how you start writing dialogue you create two or more characters who have different wants and different personalities and you create them in some detail and then you put them together and you sort of let them get on with it really that's uh, it's not as simple as that I make it sound simpler than it actually is but I think the problem a lot of people have is that they start by thinking about the dialogue um, and actually, as in real life, dialogue comes out of character and it comes out of circumstance. So what you do next, like I said, is you would do a similar exercise for another character and think of a situation where they might come together, not necessarily in conflict as such, but certainly with some kind of separation um, and see, uh, let them get on with it. Let their dialogue um, emerge out of that. OK, um, so it's nearly 10 to. So that was pretty much everything I was planning to do for this session. Um, has anybody got any questions or any thoughts that you want to put in the Q&A? Yeah, I I definitely recommend this book, Playwriting, a Practical Guide, even if you're not particularly interested in writing plays as such. It's really good for all kinds of, um, well, I was going to say all kinds of dramatic writing, but actually not just dramatic writing. It's very useful for any kind of um, any kind of writing that involves character, really. So, OK, well, thank you. Thank you, Anita. Are there any questions? OK, I'll just go back to my first slide. So that's me, David Cottis. Um, and that's my email address, d.cottis at mdx.ac.uk. So if you do have any questions about the programme or about any of the things we've been talking about, um, that's my email address. Um, and so drop me an email and I imagine I'll see some of you uh, at Middlesex. So thanks very much. OK, if there's no questions, let me just check the Q&A one last time. All right, I'll stop sharing. And I think we can wind it up, Chris. Yeah, thanks so much, David, um, for that really interesting session. I hope uh, you all enjoyed it too. Um, as David said, you've got his email if uh, you have any questions. Um, and also, you can, if you're interested in studying film, you know, we've got a course page that you can look at, or you can come up to one of our upcoming open days, which you can find on our website. Um, but yeah, so thank you for everyone for, for joining and uh, have a great rest of the day. Cheers all.